Hi, my name is Dylan, and I will be going over Chapter 18 of the Barron's AP Economics book and what you need to know for the AP exam. Here's what you need to know for this chapter. You need to know what the concept of fiat money is, how the money supply of America works, what the Federal Reserve is, what reserve requirements are, how money expands, and the three policy tools of the Fed. So, the money supply of America is broken up into different components. M1 is what you would call, which is what you would normally define as money, and it's just straight up money that you can easily buy stuff with. So like dollar bills, you know, coins, and it also includes stuff like checking accounts, so you can, and traveler's checks. Basically stuff that if you go to a shop and you hand them some form of this, they'll accept it. So M2 includes M1, but also can, includes money that's not really exchangeable in its current state, but you can easily convert it into M1. So, so this is stuff like K savings account, like you can easily move money from your savings account to your checking account, and other stuff like certificates of deposit and retail money funds. So what is fiat money? The current currency of the United States is an example of fiat money. And fiat money is money that's not backed by anything other than the belief that it's worth something and that's legal tender. For example, a dollar bill that you have, that's actually not worth anything. It's just it's completely worthless. But it's the idea that you, people think that a dollar is worth a dollar and that people are and that you have to take the dollars as as money. And that's what the essence of fiat money is. You might think what how what, why would people even accept fiat money? Well, the United States used to be something on something called the gold standard, and that's when the dollar was not was actually backed by something. So that dollar was was actually worth a certain amount of gold. But the problem is that, that the gold standard restricts the availability of money, and it restricts governments. And because there's only a finite amount of money available, because each money relates to a certain amount of gold, um, and it's it's a very fixed. And when the government wants to use lots of money, and when the economy is constantly expanding, the gold standard fails. So this is where fiat money comes in. And fiat money allows people to, um, allows governments to spend a lot of money, allows the economies to grow, and the way that f that fiat money, fiat money is actually worth something um, is be the because the money supply is still kept limited. If you printed like a million a billion um, dollar bills to suddenly your um, suddenly your dollar bills not worth anything because there's a billion more just like it and you can easily get a lot and this is an example of inflation so the only way the only way fiat money can actually work is if uh, the government or whatever central bank or whatever um, keeps the money in check and that's how fiat money works so what's the point of money money serves as an exchange tool and you can easily buy goods and services without having to barter. It also it streamlines the trade system, really. Um, money also allows people to compare different things. So you can compare like a TV and a new jacket, two different things. But with money, you can actually compare them now. And money also stores the wealth of a person. So if I work for 10 years, I'm able to store what I worked for in the form of money. So the America's money supply is controlled by an independent organization known as the Fed or the Federal Reserve System. It's actually not part of the government. It's the central bank of the U.S. and it's in charge of the money supply and it also, it's also controls the other banks of the United States. So the Federal Reserve mandates banks to carry a portion of money deposit as reserves. So for example, if I deposit $100 into a bank, the, ba the bank has to carry a portion of it, let's just say $10 as reserve. And this is known as the reserve requirement. With the rest of my money, the bank will probably end up investing it or giving out loans and stuff. However, I can always withdraw my money. My money is still there, but, the, but it's not really there. Like the bank takes it and they give it out, but I can, if I decided to went to a bank and said, I want my $100 back, they'll give it to me. And that's how it works. And the Fed uses reserve requirements as a way of controlling the money supply of the United States. And the reserve requirement has been at 10% for a while. So as, as I said before, banks can lend out a portion of my money. However, I still have my money. It's just, it's just there in the bank. If I don't withdraw, I have $100, and the bank can lend out 90 to someone else. And let's say that person spends that 90 and that money goes to someone, so like, let's say a short shop owner. Now the shop owner can deposit it into a bank and the bank can lend a portion of it, but that person still has his money. 
And notice how extra money is created from my initial deposit. There was only $100, but somehow the bank created more, created another 90, and then created more money because that, that guy deposited it, and the bank lent it out again. And it keeps on going, and the bank just keeps on creating money from the money that I deposited. And this will keep on happening until there's no more money lent. And this is sort of like a money multiplier. The money multiplier is equal to 1 divided by the reserve requirement. When a person deposits money to a bank, the money supply will change by number equal to the multiplier times the change in bank reserves. Now, the Fed has a few policy options to change the money supply of America. So I talked about the first one, which is they can change the reserve requirements of banks. If the Fed lowers the reserve requirements, banks can lend more money, which will increase the money supply. If the Fed raises the reserve requirements, banks will hold force to hold more money in reserve, which will decrease the money supply. The second, tool, the second tool is called the discount rate. And the discount rate is the rate of interest that the Fed charges for banks. If the Fed raises the discount rate, banks will borrow less from the Fed and therefore make less loans, and this will decrease the money supply. If the Fed lowers the discount rate, banks will borrow more from the Fed and more, make more loans, increasing the money supply. However, the discount rate is mostly a symbolic thing, because borrowing from the Fed will make it seem make the bank seem like it's in trouble. The rate more commonly used is called the federal funds rate, and that's the interest rate the banks charge each other for overnight loans. Um, these overnight loans are usually if a bank can't, because the bank has to meet the reserve requirement by a certain time, and if that bank doesn't meet it, they'll borrow from another bank really quickly, and they'll borrow it at an interest rate called the federal funds rate. And lastly, the Fed can conduct an open market operation. And the, open, open, and the open market operation is the most commonly used tool to change the money supply. And in an open market operation, the Fed can buy or sell government securities on the market to increase or decrease the money supply. If the Fed buys government securities, the money supply will increase because the Fed will be putting money into the economy and giving banks to lend out. If the Fed sells government securities, they will take money out of the economy and it will decrease the money supply. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something from this video.